I survived 100 days of Skyblock in Hardcore Minecraft, a game mode in which I'm left stranded on this floating island of dirt, surrounded by the void, which, for some reason, I thought would be a relaxing break from my regular Hardcore series. Over the next 100 days, I'll be expanding this lump of dirt into a full-fledged base, fit with automatic farms, villagers, and so much more. And of course, I'll also be beating the Ender Dragon and the Wither if I don't run out of time. But like every rags to riches story, it all stems from a humble beginning. So we have pretty much a classic Skyblock world here. This is Skyblock Infinite though. Which means we'll not only have access to blocks from every biome in the game, but also an infinite void filled with randomly generated structures. Like ocean monuments, ancient cities, and strongholds, which will be very important later on. So, without wasting any more time, I began day zero by seeing if I'd be lucky enough to get any seeds from the grass on my island. And when that failed, I started removing the top layer of dirt so I could do some expanding. One of the most common ways to fail this challenge is to not get a sapling from your very first tree. That, and ruining your cobblestone generator like I did in my last attempt. So, I wanted to be extra careful not to lose any saplings to the void. Maybe I should expand this again. But I was far too lazy for that, and instead resorted to punching the leaves with my fists in hope of catching the saplings if they fell. But none did. So to distract myself from the thought of needing to restart this challenge yet again, I began preparing everything I'd need for a cobble generator, and then gave the remaining leaves the most disgusted look a faceless man could give until they finally submitted. With my first sapling secured and my will to live restored, I began working on the cobblestone generator. And upgraded my pickaxe. My next objective was to continue farming stone until I could craft slabs and begin the expansion. With a shovel and the slabs in hand, I started removing the bottom layers of dirt, trying my best not to lose any to the void. In the end, there was only one casualty and I even got the dirt collector advancement for having a full stack. I spent the rest of the night mining cobblestone and placing more slabs until the sun rose on day one. My goal for this day was to continue using cobblestone to expand the base and to hopefully build a second platform for mobs to spawn on. If I could get bones, I'd be able to bone mill the ground and get the seeds I needed for my first food source. So I started the day with a bit of mining and then reorganized the base, moving the cobblestone generator to a more permanent location and adding an extra layer of slabs around the edge for safety. At this point, I was starting to get hungry, so I began mining more cobblestone to build the mob platform. Starting to see a pattern yet? With night quickly approaching, I used all the cobblestone I had left to build it, and returned home to a fully grown tree, which put my firefighting skills to the test. That night, I got my second sapling, which meant that the show could go on. A little later, my first zombie spawned on the new platform and I realized that it probably wasn't a good idea to give him direct access to my base. Sir, I think you have something that is mine. I'm going to ask you to kindly return it to me. Give me the slab. I burned my slab. With the zombie shenanigans over, I returned home to another sapling which pretty much guaranteed I'd have a lasting supply of wood. To wrap up the night, I acquired my first charcoal, which I used to light up my island, and then noticed that a few skeletons had spawned on the platform. So, not wanting them to despawn, I put the baby down for a nap and AFK'd the rest of the night within the 24 block range. As all good days do, day two began with the burning of my enemies, and after carefully dealing with the creepers, I finally had access to bones, and some string. As planned, I used the bones to make bone meal and get some seeds. Crafted up a stone hoe, removed this tree, and willed an apple into existence. I think I'm actually going to save it, because we need two golden apples to eventually get villagers. And I don't want to just eat that right now if I don't need to. And so I shifted my focus to using a trick with seagrass to create a second water source, giving me access to infinite water. I spent most of the day mining cobblestone and chopping down trees, then added a makeshift drawbridge between my island and the mob platform for extra safety, 
and continued expanding the platform so that I could hopefully get more mobs than I did the previous night. Then it was back to the old cobble grind, until I got bored and decided to test out my new drawbridge. Needing a place to plant my wheat, I began working on a lower platform on one side of the base. But by the time it was finished, and I had planted the seeds, I realized that I'd been too far away from the mob platform, and that they'd all despawned, which meant I was going to have to work with whatever bone meal I had left. I ended up with three wheat, just enough to craft my first piece of bread and refill my hunger and replenish my health, which was a great sign. And as a bonus, I even got a second apple, meaning that any I got in the future would be fair game to eat. For the rest of the day, the only thing I had on my mind was expansion. So on each side, I started marking out where the future staircases would go, and then worked on replicating the lower layer I had for my farm on each of the other sides of the circle, a process that would end up taking me the entire day and part of the night due to my lack of cobblestone. Upon finishing the last side, I was able to rebuild my drawbridge, but then I got a little too greedy. I wanted to trap the Enderman in a boat so I could kill him for pearls, but my plan for dealing with the skeleton didn't go so well. Did he cross? Okay. So like a Fortnite player caught with their pants down, I began building, completely sealing myself off and buying myself time to think. Not wanting to waste the rest of the night cowering in a box, I realized that if I could get to my chest, I could heal myself using the apples I was saving and try to make a play. So I ate a couple and ran to the tree for cover. Treating Minecraft like a medieval FPS game, I made a play. With my newfound braveness, I decided to take on the spiders too, in hopes of eventually getting enough string for a bed. But I was still a long way off. On day 4, I began filling the new edges of the platform with planks, moving my crafting station over to one of them, and came to the conclusion that the main thing holding me back right now was not having access to a steady supply of bone meal. The makeshift mob farm I'd been using so far had only given me enough bones for a single piece of bread, and had almost led to my demise, so it was time to start working towards constructing an actual mob farm, starting with the removal of the old one. Due to my stone tools, this took nearly a whole day, and with the daylight I had left, I filled in the rest of the planks on the edges, mined some more cobblestone, shocker, and replenished my apple supply. Knowing a full-scale mob farm would take stacks upon stacks of cobblestone, I dedicated the entire night to mining. But then my plans were interrupted. I used my chest as cover, blocking two of the phantom's attacks, and then locked myself in a one by one. So here I was again, spending another night hiding. But I knew that if I could just get a small roof over the cobble generator, I'd be safe enough to continue the mining. So, slowly but surely, I did just that. With the roof above my head, I was able to continue making progress, but I still wasn't entirely safe. And when the sun rose on day 5, I was at half health, hungry, and morale was low. But complaining about my situation wasn't going to change anything, so I began working on the staircase that would lead to the mob farm, built the platform where the killing area would be, and then noticed that my island was on fire. Thankfully, the only thing that ended up being damaged was me. After spawn-proofing the new areas I built, the only thing I could really do was craft up a few more pickaxes and spend the rest of the night mining. And to make my lowest point even lower, the game decided that now was a good time for a thunderstorm. This is where I get struck by lightning and die. But what I didn't know was that day 6 would be the day that everything changed. Wait. Hold on. Can we fish? I'm so dumb. So yeah, after days of struggling to manage my health and hunger, it turned out that I had an unlimited food source right at my fingertips the entire time. Watching my health regenerate here was probably the most satisfying moment I'd had so far. With this boost in morale, I was ready to start working on the mob farm, but was surprised to find out that day 6 was already coming to an end. 
So I doubled down on fishing to further increase my stock of food, and apparently lily pads. And just when the sun was starting to rise, it began to rain. Again. So the next thing that I want to do is I want to take the center of our island here and turn it into a pond for fishing. I also want to move the edge of the grass blocks out. So we're going to take the dirt from the middle and we're going to put it around the edge. And so for the rest of the day and into the night, I reorganized my island, creating a pond that was big enough to get treasure drops. And in the midst of being bullied by phantoms, I noticed a wandering trader had spawned. But I couldn't really do much about it with all the phantoms, so I passed the night by collecting cobblestone and doing some fishing. In the morning, I could finally visit my new friend, but to be honest, I didn't really like anything he had to offer. Not that I could have afforded it anyways, but that didn't mean that I was going to go home empty-handed. And for the first time in days, I was able to continue working on the mob farm again, starting with the drop shoot, building out each side of the plus sign, adding a border around it, and making sure that I made it home before the phantoms came out to play. It wasn't bad progress for a day of work, but I needed to spend the night gathering more cobblestone if I was going to finish it anytime soon. Once the phantoms were burning, I harvested all the trees that had grown, and made my way up to the mob farm with the intention of hopefully finishing the first layer today. But even though I was able to finish the outer edge and build it up to be two blocks high, before I could make much progress on the spawning platforms, it started thunderstorming yet again. The thing about thunderstorms is that they allow phantoms to spawn, so without any armor or proper weapons, it's not really a good idea to be out here building in one. So you'll never guess what I did next. Yep, another night of fishing and mining. I did manage to catch a name tag that night, but I am alone on an island in the middle of the void, so... Day 10, I continued working on the mob farm. I was 10% of the way through this challenge, and I still felt like I was struggling to get by. But I was able to complete the first layer of the spawning platform today, then line the edge with another layer of blocks, place the trap doors along the inner edge to trick the mobs into walking off, and add the water that would push them into the center. It was great progress for a day's work, but it didn't come without a cost. My supply of cobblestone was completely diminished, and I'd used all the wood I had on the trap doors. But that night, the thought occurred to me that I could add a second stream of water to my cobble generator, and this would go on to nearly double my cobble production, which had a major role in helping me finish the farm. By the morning, I had finished almost 5 stacks of cobblestone. Using that, I was able to finish both layers on the outer edge before getting caught out in the rain yet again. By now, I was genuinely starting to wonder if there was something wrong with my world, because it couldn't seem to go a full day without raining. To keep myself from losing my mind, I put on a YouTube video and mined away the pain. The next morning, I didn't waste any time harvesting my crops or trees, because if I'd learned anything this far, it was that I probably wouldn't have more than 5 minutes before another thunderstorm would strike and leave me with nothing to do but mine. So I built as if my life depended on it, completely finishing the second layer of spawning platforms, and even the entire outer wall. From there, I made as much progress as I could with the roof but I wasn't quite able to finish it before the night fell and phantoms were upon me. Running back to base, I spent the night trying to gather as much wood and stone as possible. I was determined to finish the mob farm by the next night. Day 13, I started the day by harvesting the wheat, and then it was back to the mob farm, where I finished up the roof, added all the trapdoors, and started building up the drop chute. I wanted to leave a few gaps near the bottom that would hopefully allow me to block off the farm in the future in case I needed to. With the final blocks in place, all that was left to do was remove the torches and ride my water slide down to the bottom. Of course, it was already raining again by now, but that wasn't going to stop me. The farm was operational, aside from the fact that the creepers were able to see me. After a little more farming, I managed to get my first few pieces of armor. Killed my first enderman and shortly after, got some enchanted golden boots to replace the leather. Then I very nearly murdered my first zombie villager. Luckily, I noticed just in time and was able to very carefully block off the farm. Then it was just a matter of picking off the remaining mobs with my axe until the only thing left was my new friend. In the process, I noticed that I picked up some music discs that must have dropped from skeletons killing creepers while I was trying to block off the farm. After isolating the zombie villager, I expanded the platform a bit to make trapping him in a boat a little easier. 
I got a little distracted while letting him out, as this was the first time I'd seen a zombie villager with the fresh animations resource pack, and he looked a little funny to me. He didn't seem to like that remark, and made sure to let me know by backhanding my kneecap, but after sliding his boat across the cobblestone like it was on a patch of ice, I was one step closer to obtaining villagers. I decided to take this opportunity to redesign the farm's killing area, and then began reopening the farm when I noticed another zombie villager. But there was now an enderman stopping me from closing off the farm again, so I hit him, and chaos ensued. I was able to make it back to my island in time to remove the bottom of the staircase, allowing me to safely dispatch all the zombies that followed me down. Using the string from the farm, I crafted enough wool for a bed, and used it to sleep in hopes that the sun would help me deal with some of the mobs. Of course, with the giant roof overhead, that was wishful thinking, and I instead opted for crafting a bow, which I used to pick off mob after mob before rushing back up to try to seal off the hole that the creeper blew up. But every time I started gaining ground, more mobs would rain down on top of me. And after taking a few hits, I had no choice but to fall back. However, the longer I waited, the more mobs I'd have to deal with, and I was running out of arrows, so I had to make a move. And by some miracle, I was able to get enough blocks down to patch up all the holes. And by some even bigger miracle, the zombie villager had survived being dropped from the top of the farm and being blown up by a creeper. So I put him in a boat next to his friend and spent the rest of the night fixing up the mob farm, adding a railing around the edge and redesigning the killing area to hopefully keep it from blowing up again. The mobs had been stacking up the entire time I was building and I ended up getting a full set of armor from these guys and a power two bow. My next order of business was to figure out a way to trap the witch, and so I began building an area on the other side of the platform. Once it was ready, I pillared up to close off the farm, and, well... The witch must have thrown a potion that damaged the rest of the mobs, causing the creeper to blow up. Luckily, she survived the encounter, and the damage to the farm itself was minimal. This time, I approached from a different angle that made closing the farm off much safer. Then it was just a matter of removing the leftover mobs, and bringing the witch to her new ride. Which was a little awkward at first, but nothing a slab to the shin couldn't fix. She then proceeded to remove the entirety of my hit points with two potions, and I'm lucky that this last one wasn't a potion of harming, because that probably would have killed me. Somehow, I was again left fighting for control of my own mob farm. But with a few punches to the boat, I was able to get the witch to the far end of the chamber. This was just an incredibly dumb move that nearly got me killed. And with nothing but a couple apples left for food, I needed to rethink things. I grabbed some cooked fish from the furnace, but decided to switch it out for some bread, not knowing which one was more effective. Turns out they're exactly the same. Although with my new supply of bones, bread was the easier one to get. I finally mustered up the courage to give the witch another go and managed to actually block her off a little, but she laughed in my face and demonstrated that she could still hit me through the bottom gap. I decided that I'd had more than enough abuse for the night and after thinking about what my next major goal would be, began mining cobblestone in preparation. I didn't stop mining until the evening of day 17, and with all the cobblestone ready, it was time to begin giving my base a makeover. I started by making the first staircase three blocks wide and then it was time to complete the remaining three staircases. My plan was to have the four staircases lead to an outer ring. This outer ring would be where the mob farm and future iron farm would be located. Thanks to my bed, I was able to trick the game into thinking I slept. By laying down and getting up before the night is skipped, the game still registers this as sleeping, which means I was able to continue building all night without needing to worry about phantoms, allowing me to complete all four staircases. The next step was to figure out exactly how much distance there was between the top of the staircases and the middle of the island. Using this number and a website that generates pixel circles, I'd be able to build a perfect circle. For the rest of day 18, I continued building the inner circle, only stopping when I realized that the witch was trying to throw potions at me from the opposite side of the map. So to avoid having potions raining down while I was trying to bridge over the void, I fully boxed the witch in. 
Now at this point, the fake sleeping trick was fairly new to me, and I wasn't fully convinced that it worked, so rather than risk getting hit into the void by a phantom, I decided to take the night to restock on cobblestone, something I was going to need to do sooner or later anyways. But after a full night without phantoms, I'd be more comfortable relying on that trick in the future. With the witch now trapped in her bunker, I was able to safely complete the inner circle. And then throughout the night, the outer circle as well. On day 20, I was trying to decide what I should use to fill in the middle. And although cobblestone had served me well up to this point, I didn't want my entire base to be built out of it. So I bridged over to the taiga biome so I could get my hands on the best wood in the game. From there, I essentially relived day 0 all over again, placing down a cobblestone platform to catch all the blocks and destroying the entire island. This gave me access to extra dirt, as well as snow, a pumpkin, but most importantly, not one, but two spruce saplings. And so I ran home, eagerly thinking of all the new possibilities destroying an entire ecosystem had granted me. After fake sleeping, I began clearing out all of the oak trees to make room for the far superior spruce trees. Speaking of making room, I wanted to start expanding the main island. There was only so much space around the pond to grow trees, and I wanted to start growing giant taiga trees as my main source of wood. So I crafted as many spruce slabs as I could, and started filling in my new platform. Of course, that wasn't enough to fill in all of it, but it gave me the space I needed to start growing them. And breaking these massive trees down for blocks was such a nice change of scenery from the usual cobblestone mining. Harvesting just one of these gave me enough slabs to fill in the entire platform something that probably would have taken me a whole night if I'd used cobblestone. With everything now filled in, I was able to use the dirt I got from the taiga island to plant more saplings, and then chop down another tree before dedicating the rest of my night to mining cobblestone, because as much as I liked spruce, I still needed something different for the outlines. Using the cobblestone from the night before, I started outlining the other sides of the platform. Again, the witch was proving to be a nuisance, so I finally finished her cage. For the rest of day 22 and into the night, I finished the cobblestone outlines. I didn't have a clear idea for exactly what I'd be putting in each quadrant yet, but I knew I'd eventually need space for villagers, another portal, and extra storage. I decided to add little bridges between the quadrants underneath the staircases, mostly because I was too lazy to walk around them every time. For the entirety of day 23, my life consisted of chopping trees, placing slabs, chopping trees, placing slabs, until the morning of day 24, when they were finally complete. The next thing on my agenda was to build a villager breeder. And yes, it would have been utterly useless until I cured the zombie villagers, but I wanted to have it ready in advance. So it was time to reactivate the mob farm. For the villager breeder, I was going to need 4 beds, and I only had enough string for 5 wool. So I had some grinding to do. About 4 minutes later, I had enough for the bed. But after a little inventory management, I realized that I also needed 4 more wool for the carpet, so it was back to farming string. And in the process, I got an unexpected bonus. Ooh, we got our first iron ingot. This time, the string took a lot longer to farm, because I didn't already have a buildup of mobs waiting to be killed. But I wasn't too worried about it, because in the end, I walked away with a lot of useful loot. I chose the quadrant closest to the mob farm to house the villagers. This way, I wouldn't have to waste as much time transporting them. I went for a pretty standard design for the villager breeder and added a platform to the top where I could push the villagers in. Being in the area for so long, there were a ton of mobs waiting to be killed, and I ended up getting a really good bow from them. I decided to use my iron ingot to make a shield, as I figured that this would be the best use for it for now. I also used the bones to make bone meal and craft some more bread and this was all in preparation for going to the nether. I had never lit a nether portal using lava before, so I wasn't sure what the best strategy was, but whatever I did here seemed to work. So into the nether I went. I'm not sure what the nether is like on other skyblock maps, but with this one, it's also made up of floating islands. The center one being a ruined portal with two gold blocks on the top. Two gold blocks that I couldn't mine, because all I had was a stone pickaxe. And so if I wanted to cure the zombie villagers, I was going to need to build a gold farm. Because it's in the nether, I figured it'd be best to build it with something that's not flammable, 
which left me with um, eight minutes later I had what I hoped would be enough cobblestone and back into the nether I went. First things first, I needed to spawn proof and expand the area around the portal, because the last thing I would want is to bridge out into the void, turn around, and have an army of mobs waiting for me at my portal. And then I began working on the actual gold farm, starting with the drop chute, which I built out of slabs in order to save resources. Once I got to the top, I bridged out 20 blocks from the center, and constructed the spawning platforms. And while I'm sure there's more efficient designs for a simple gold farm, I had to make do with the blocks I had because what I didn't have was the sanity to go back and mine more cobblestone. Once the farm was complete, all I had to do was aggro the zombie piglins. And once they pushed each other down the hole, I could begin farming. But it seemed like the majority of the piglins were either getting pushed off the edge or stuck at the top. So I redesigned it, making it more of a straight line to hopefully make it run better. And it definitely helped, but the main thing holding the farm back was that the freshly spawned piglins needed a hit with an arrow before they'd aggro. So after cleaning up the ones left over, I tried to fix the problem. Zombie piglins have a mechanic that allows them to relay their anger to other nearby piglins. And so my theory was that if I could trap one in a boat at the bottom, the freshly spawned ones would already be angry at me. So I was going to try pushing one down, but then this happened. In hindsight, all I had to do was block off the bridge, and everything would have been fine. But it took me a while to realize just how big of a problem this actually was. Luckily, my theory was incorrect, because the angry mob at the bottom of my pillar wasn't causing the new piglins to aggro on me. Which meant all I had to do was clear them out and patch up the chute. So a potentially deadly mistake turned out to not be so bad after all. Or in other words... Yeah, this was a dumb idea, we're not doing this. So the temporary workaround I came up with was to stand on a platform at the top until a large amount of piglins had accumulated at the bottom. This is when I noticed there was actually a regular piglin in the mix, and if I could get him out, I'd be able to barter with him using gold from the farm. So I used my axe to kill everything else, trapping him in a boat on the edge of the platform. I tried bartering with him, and got bricks. After learning that I could be hit through the wall, it was finally time to get what I'd came here for. Enough gold to make two golden apples. So over the course of the next five minutes, I farmed as many zombie piglins as I could. After crafting up the ingots, I went back to the overworld to make the apples. In order to actually cure the villagers, I was going to need the witch to throw a weakness potion at them. And based on how my previous encounters with her went, I wasn't confident that my armor would be strong enough to tank her harming potions. And so my plan was to farm more gold and barter with the piglin for iron nuggets so that I could make iron armor. This plan was stupid for a multitude of reasons. Number one, there's only a 2% chance to get iron nuggets when bartering. Number two, I could have used the gold to make golden apples that would have been way better in helping me tank the potions. And number three, armor doesn't reduce the damage harming potions do unless it has the protection enchantment. So yeah. After 10 minutes of farming and bartering, this was the only iron I ended up getting. And once the piglin had officially gone as insane as I was, I put him and this operation out of its misery. At least we got gravel. Upon returning home and cleaning out my inventory, I farmed a bunch more wheat so I could make more bread. I spent the night preparing the platform, making enough space to slide both of the zombie villagers in position next to the witch cage before clearing out the mob farm so I could actually hear myself think. And then it was go time. Witches have quite a complicated attack pattern that depends on both your health and how far away you are from them. If you're within 7 blocks and you have at least 4 hearts, the witch will always throw a poison potion, which I clearly didn't know at the time. If you fall below 4 hearts, or if you're already poisoned, the witch opts for a harming potion. Once you step within the 3 block range, there's a 25% chance the witch will throw a weakness potion instead of the harming one. I wasn't quick enough to cure both zombies the first time it happened, but shortly after, I got the second one too. While they were curing, I worked on boxing in the witch again, and readying the platform above the villager breeder. Then it was just a matter of moving them over. And thanks to the boats and preparation I did, it was very easy. 
After removing the upper platform and the guardrails around it, I silenced the angry mobs. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to wait until the villagers slept before I started feeding them, so I chose to play it safe and spend the rest of the day chopping trees. When the night came, I was able to fence off the entire quadrant where the villagers would live. But the floating fences just didn't look very good to me, so the cobble generator claimed another one of my precious nights. Day 33, I finished placing all the slabs underneath the fences, and finally fed the villagers some bread. But after creepily staring at them waiting for something to happen, nothing did. And this wasn't the first time I had issues with this villager breeder design. I tried both bread and potatoes, but nothing was working. So I tore it down and decided that my villagers were going to be raised free range. Or at least, more free range than before. With nothing else to do but wait, I decided to fix my Enderman infestation. You see, when I built the mob farm, I made the top layer one block too tall. This meant that Enderman could spawn on the top and then teleport anywhere on my island. Up until this point, I was fine profiting off the free pearls. But now that I had villagers, I'd soon be able to trade for them, making this an entirely unnecessary safety risk. Speaking of... So began the 10 minute process of removing the entire roof just so I could place it all back down. But I shouldn't ever need to deal with Enderman here again. For some reason, when I got to the bottom, the farm was filled with nothing but creepers. So I'm thinking that they must have some sort of advantage over the rest of the mobs when it comes to entity cramming. Conspiracies aside, my villagers were finally breeding. And I'm not gonna lie, I was obsessed with the new baby villager animations from the Fresh Animations pack. I'll leave a link to it in the description in case you guys want to try it out. I used the gravel I got from bartering to get enough flint for a few fletching tables. Then I used the iron I had to create an iron axe as an investment for my new stick company. Of course, it broke less than 5 minutes later, but it allowed me to collect more logs. Logs equal sticks, sticks equal emeralds, and with enough emeralds, the possibilities were endless. After a bunch more trading, I ended up with 56 of them. Next, I placed a composter down so I could get a farmer, and I did some more stick trades. With the new farmer, I could now buy the bread I needed to breed more villagers. While maxing out his trades, I couldn't help but try the soup. Ah, I can't see! Just a few trades later, I had access to the best food in the game. While harvesting my sugar cane that night, I could have sworn I heard a meow. And sure enough, it turned out to be a picky eater, but that wasn't going to stop me. I finally had a chance to make a friend. Yay! After bringing my cat home, my next focus was collecting string, so I spent the rest of the night at the mob farm. In the morning, I used the string to craft another bed for the villagers, and showed this guy that there was only enough room for one protector of the villagers in these parts. I used his remains to craft a smithing table, giving me access to a toolsmith, which, when leveled up, would be able to sell me diamond tools. But for that, I was going to need iron. I wasn't quite ready to build an iron farm yet, because I wanted to wait until I had more villagers at my disposal. To speed up that process, I crafted a loom and used it to get a shepherd villager that I could buy beds from. But to unlock those, I needed to first trade sticks for emeralds, and then work my way through the trades. Now instead of grinding all night in the mob farm for a single bed, I could buy them for an emerald apiece. All these beds meant I could house way more villagers and breed them up faster which also meant that I was going to need a lot of sticks if I wanted to keep up with the new trades I was unlocking. And so the night was spent chopping down trees. Day 37 began with uninvited visitors, but my friend made short work of them. So I gave him the role of guarding my portal. Then it was business as usual, buying bread to feed my villagers, trading for emeralds, and rinse and repeat. Then began plans for the construction of the iron farm. I wanted to build the same design that I have in my main hardcore series. The only problem with that is that the design is typically built underground, but I couldn't think of a reason why it wouldn't work if it was built floating in the sky. So that's what I was going to do. The middle of the iron farm is usually a hole in the ground, with water pushing golems to a central drop chute. I used fence posts in exchange for the walls the hole usually provides. When open, the fence gates in the middle allow the golems to pass through, but not the water, which I added next. Before moving on, I expanded the lower platform a bit more, then pillared up and constructed the first villager module. 
leaving enough room inside for three villagers and the zombie. It was only now that I realized just how ugly this thing was, but I'd fix it up eventually. The next step was to get the villagers up here, but instead of building a staircase out of planks that would take forever to clean up, I used my gravel to craft coarse dirt, which could then be turned into path blocks and broken to obtain regular dirt, allowing me to build the staircase out of a block that was much easier to break. And it was only at the top that I ran out and was forced to use the planks. Then it was just a matter of luring villagers, using leftover composters, and this process ended up being way simpler than I anticipated. Just five composters later, and I had my first villager in the farm. I pushed him into the zombie side for now so that he wouldn't escape while I was bringing up the other two. Soon enough, villager number two had found his way up into the trap. Villager number three followed shortly after. Then I built an exit for short people only, and bought the villagers' beds completely on the house. I thought it was interesting that I wasn't able to enter my door by jumping, but as soon as I have a block under me, I can magically fit. And I'm not sure if you caught that, so I'll show it again. Turns out the third villager was actually parkour legend Michael Scott, and had left me completely confused, thinking one of the villagers had died. Wait a minute. Where did this guy go? So I built the staircase higher so I could drop another one in tomorrow. And for the rest of the night, worked on adding a spawning platform for the zombie. I couldn't get one to spawn yet, but that was okay, because the drop chute wasn't ready yet anyways. So that's what I worked on the morning of day 40, again using slabs to conserve resources. I built layer after layer, making sure the gaps in between weren't big enough for a golem to fit through. Once I was nearing the top, I decided to skip a few layers and finish the top ones so that I could use the remaining daylight to get the final villager. But I ran out of time, so I had to use beds instead of composters. Making sure there were less beds than villagers, I continued luring him until he finally linked to the extra bed in the farm. Once he was in, I started expanding the zombie platform in hopes that it would work better than the night before. After some time, I actually got one, and it walked straight into the boat trap. I quickly placed a roof above his room, and a boat in the middle. And then I was ready for him. I totally almost fell to my death here because of the slab on the top, but after removing the blocks, the zombie made his way into the farm, and in the boat, meaning the iron farm should be working. And sure enough, there was already an iron golem at the top. I had some cleaning up to do before I could open it up for business, like removing the zombie platform, the pillar I built the villager module on, and the giant staircase. Then I opened up all the fence gates allowing the golems to fall, and finished building the rings that I had skipped. That might be the ugliest iron farm ever. The last step was to grab the lava from my cobble generator, place it in the farm, and that was it. I now had access to probably the most crucial resource in my progression. The stone age had officially ended. I gave the villagers their beds back, and was finally able to start making progress with my toolsmith, unlocking an enchanted iron pickaxe and, more importantly, an axe. Which I happened to have the perfect amount of emeralds for. This was probably the most exciting thing that had happened in a while, because having nothing more than stone tools for 40 days made iron ones with efficiency feel illegal. So I chopped trees until my new axe was about to break, and then came to the genius realization that hoppers were something I could actually craft now. So I did just that, and now the iron farm had an actual collection system. I woke my Fletchers up in the middle of the night to sell them sticks, and used the profits to buy two more axes and a pickaxe. With my old tools disposed of, I chopped down another tree to restock my stick supply, and placed two grindstones to get weaponsmiths. Unlike toolsmiths, weaponsmiths are guaranteed to have a diamond axe trade, and I wanted to unlock that as soon as possible. But I leveled up the toolsmith anyway, because the other tools would still be helpful. Checking the iron farm, I got enough ingots to level up both my new weaponsmiths. But their new trades were complete garbage, and I was going to need more iron to level them up. For now, I did stick trades, bought some golden carrots, and some bread to breed more villagers. The rest I invested in more beds, and then it was back to the old grind. It seemed like no matter how many trees I chopped down, I was always out of emeralds again the next night. In the morning, I crafted a blast furnace so I could finally begin working towards better armor. And so the trading for the day began, 
I started with the toolsmith, unlocking a really nice diamond pick trade, and then moved on to the armor, grabbing more iron, and finally, after one more level up, I could now trade for a very good diamond axe. After buying out both my Fletchers for the day, I had a perfect stack of emeralds, and bought myself my first diamond axe. However, this is where I started to hit a wall, because all of the villagers I wanted to level up required iron, and having just one module on the iron farm wasn't enough to keep up with the demand. And so I took advantage of my now insanely fast tools and started farming the wood I would need to build additional modules. Realistically, I didn't actually need to upgrade the farm. Over time, one module would be enough to produce all the iron I needed. But waiting that long would use up precious time and limit my progress over the 100 days. Plus, having built the first module, the design was still fresh in my mind, and I was able to finish the entire second module and build the zombie platform before the night was over. Like the first time, I didn't have any luck spawning one. So the next day, I removed it and bridged out even further away from my mob farm, hoping that would help solve the issue. And then it was time to build modules 3 and 4, linking both of them to module 2 so I could use the same staircase and zombie platform when it was time to populate them. And once night arrived, it was time to bring in the zombies. I didn't have much luck at first, only getting a lonely spider. So I bridged out even further and built another platform. This finally did the trick, getting me a zombie in less than a minute later. I lured him into the boat, just like last time, rebuilt the stairs, and waited for the next one, which turned out to be two, and upon luring them back, I realized that I didn't really have a way to handle two at once. So I had to settle for one, helping him into the boat, and realizing I was too late to get the third. In the meantime, I started working on the villagers, this time pre-placing the composters and breaking them from the ground up, so the villagers would automatically link to the next one. With this new and improved method, I was able to bring up three villagers by nightfall, completing module two. Unfortunately, it took me four minutes that night to get a zombie to spawn, but once it did, I lured it over to the other modules and into the fourth, meaning all I needed now was six more villagers. I bought the remaining beds for my shepherd and placed them down, leaving me fully prepared for some bright and early villager napping. And this ended up being a full day of transporting villagers. From sunrise to sunset, all I did was deal with these baboons. These sad Squidward wannabes. And as much as I wanted nothing more than to give them a little shove off the iron farm at times, at the end of the day, I tucked them in goodnight. And that was the entire iron farm complete. From there, I started removing all the bridges I'd built between the modules, then took down the zombie platforms, and as the sun was rising, signaling the approach of day 47, the iron farm was not only now symmetrical, but roughly four times as productive. As an added bonus, the farm was running the entire time I was building, and had produced around eight stacks of iron, allowing me to finally start maxing out all of my iron-hungry villagers, and unlock trades for lots of cool stuff, like diamond swords, diamond armor, which I bought right away and equipped, and after a few throwaway trades, the rest of the set. All of a sudden, all of my villagers were maxed out, and so I got more to try my luck at getting better enchantments. The armorer gave me feather falling boots, which I think are pretty much a must have for the dragon fight. I used the leather I got from bartering and some paper to craft a lectern, but the villagers were already closing up shop for the night. Of course, that didn't stop me from waking them up in the middle of the night to sell them my sticks. After a fake sleep, I proceeded to chop down every tree on my island. This pattern of trading in the day and farming resources for emeralds at night would become a common theme over the next in-game week, as I was about to go all in trying to max out my gear in preparation for the dragon fight. Day 48, the first thing on my mind was to lock in a bookshelf librarian, so I could craft more lecterns and cycle through the enchanted book trades faster. I'm going to try my best to summarize this part and just show the moments that were critical to my progress, because there's a reason Mojang is currently experimenting with reworking the trading system, and I think there's more to it than it just being too easy. It's also extremely repetitive. The first useful book I got was Mending, which I locked in straight away. An unlimited supply of the most sought after enchantment in the game in under a minute of refreshing. So you really can't blame people for complaining about this stuff, because as long as these mechanics are present, methods like fishing and chest looting will always remain left at. And I don't mean to turn this into a video essay, but this was just what was going through my mind at the time of recording this. 
The next usable enchant I got was Power 5 for 20 emeralds. So I put that as well as mending onto my bow, and bought myself a diamond sword so I could mend it faster at the mob farm. Then, like deja vu, it was back to chopping trees in the dark. Just like yesterday, I emptied out the iron farm in the morning, crafted up the sticks, traded for emeralds, and focused on the librarians again. This time, luck was not on my side, leaving me refreshing all day until I finally got something good. The rest of the refreshing that day was unsuccessful, but I used the extra emeralds I had left over to buy a diamond shovel, as well as a diamond chestplate. Then I built a square of dirt with a single grass block that I got using my silk touch pick. My goal here was to get some passive mobs to spawn once it all turned to grass. I upgraded my diamond axe that night, but it was right about now that this was starting to feel like that movie Groundhog Day. Chop wood all night, empty the iron farm in the morning, craft sticks, get on breaking three. Okay, that one was new. Can you tell I've been practicing my stick trades yet? Trade my extra iron for more emeralds. Cycle through dozens of villager trades until I get mending on two villagers back to back. And do a little bit of this. Until I get a sharpness 5 book. 44 emeralds was a little steep, but I still couldn't pass it up. I also got aqua affinity, looting 3, and respiration 3 that day. All of which I decided to keep. I combined a lot of the enchantments onto my sword and made a stop at the mob farm to try it out before returning to my overnight shift as a lumberjack. And I bet you guys could probably see the lines with me now. Empty the iron farm in the morning, craft the sticks, trade them for emeralds, get more fletchers because I have so many sticks that two isn't enough anymore. Okay, we didn't rehearse that one. But jokes aside, the only other enchant that I genuinely needed at this point was protection. I mean, really, once I got power 5, I was already fine in the weapons department. Since I had a lot of extra emeralds now, I went ahead and bought 3 unbreaking books, a pair of feather falling boots, and a fire prot helmet in case things got toasty. My iron supply was also beginning to pile up, and I was probably getting half of my emeralds from iron trades at this point. I bought a second helmet as one I could put protection on in the future, and finally a second pair of feather falling boots so I could eventually combine them for feather falling 4. But for now, I just put unbreaking on them for some reason. I'll just skip right into the next day this time because the knight had nothing new to offer. Just like all but two of the villagers I traded with today. The first being a sweeping edge trade. And while I didn't really need it, there's no point in passing up trades when you've got plenty of emeralds and spare villagers to work with. The next was selling blast protection, which I kept just in case I ended up fighting the wither. I put sweeping edge on my sword that night, did my lumberjack shift, and stared menacingly at the villagers that night. A wandering trader spawned just before sunrise, but he didn't really have much to offer. I bought some flowers and dye anyway, claimed my complimentary leads, and placed the mini Lorax trees around my pond. I'd love to talk about all the cool stuff that happened on day 53, but it appears I wrote my notes with invisible ink by accident. What a shame. Day 54 was the day of champions, whatever that means. It started off like every other day the past week did. Little did I know, this batch would give me a prot 3 trade, but I knew that if I kept going, I'd eventually get prot 4, and the price was- I took it instantly. Then I traded a ton of iron for emeralds as well as sticks, leaving me with just over 3 stacks of emeralds, allowing me to buy enough prop 3 books to make 4 prop 4 books. I upgraded my boots first, but was too poor to combine them for feather falling 4. So I hit the mob farm for a bit, and completed the upgrade. And this is how I spent my night, upgrading my armor one piece at a time, getting the inferior standard edition carrot from a zombie, and because I was tired of emptying garbage out of my inventory, I finally gave the farm a proper collection system. From there, I upgraded my pants, and after a little more grinding, my chest plate as well, completing the set. Of course, I didn't just stop there, buying a mending book for each piece of armor, as well as everything I'd need for a maxed out silk touch pick. I put mending on the helmet, chest, boots, and legs. And because the pickaxe was going to be so expensive, I had the bright idea to use the gold farm instead, which was so much better for levels than the mob farm. 
when a regular piglin fell into the farm, I decided that I'd capture him, since all the levels I was farming were giving me a lot of gold as a byproduct. So into the boat he went. But because he didn't approve of my fashion choices, I had to get some new shoes, before he would tolerate my existence. The problem was, he seemed to think my chest belonged to him. And since he had a crossbow, there was a constant worry that he'd knock me off the platform at some point, so I had no choice but to put him in a cage. It was a real shame we couldn't just get along, but at least I had something to do with all my gold now. You can't blame me though for not trusting the water he gave me. Yeah, I didn't like that. But I just continued to farm up levels in gold, the latter of which I traded with my adversary, until I had accumulated a variety of items and was no longer willing to tolerate his abuse. But no, I just couldn't take the risk of him knocking me into the void if I decided to bridge away from the platform. After returning home, I added the enchants to my pickaxe, and then I was ready to move on to the next stage. After some more stick trading, of course, but only so I could buy more food, because this next step was about to get heated. I needed to make my way over to the fortress. In most cases, building out of wood in the nether isn't a good idea, but since it was skyblock, I had control over where the mobs could spawn. I did take the time to make the bridge two blocks wide, just in case. That also gave me the confidence to sprint jump around freely. Now, those of you who have played this map before know that there's normally an end portal in this gap here. But because I wanted more of a challenge, I decided to remove it before I started the playthrough. So what that means is that in order to beat the Ender Dragon, I'm actually going to need to find a stronghold the normal way, by using Eyes of Ender. And to actually get to it, I'll need to bridge the entire way there through the void. That leads to the next step here, which is collecting blaze rods. To do that, I needed to give the mobs a place to spawn, while also keeping them in a controlled environment. And with these trap doors in place, I can remove the glowstone from the inside, allowing mobs to spawn there. And then I can just stand on the bridge and use the F3 menu to see how many mobs are in there. When the number is above zero, I can run over and hope for blazes. In this case, we already got one, along with three blaze rods. So all I had to do was repeat those steps. And by the second batch, I already had enough rods for all the eyes. Back at home, I was trying to decide where to put the nether wart farm, but I couldn't make up my mind. I was even going to give it its own dedicated area before deciding that this spot next to the fail of a passive mob farm would do just fine. And just when you thought the nights of harvesting trees were over, I was back at it. This was the last time I was doing it for emeralds though, as I only needed enough sticks and iron to level up a cleric and unlock the ender pearl trade. The first guy decided that he wasn't going to cooperate, but since I was feeling generous, I made a new brewing stand and let him live. I used rotten flesh from the gold farm to level up the new guy. And unlike his ungrateful heathen of a brother, this guy actually gave me what I needed. In combination with what I bought and the pearls I'd been saving up, I got myself a full stack and crafted them all into eyes. But this got me thinking that I should probably get myself a few more since they were so easy to get. That way I could use the obsidian I got from bartering to make an ender chest, and have a few extra eyes in case some broke. The main reason for the ender chest is that the stronghold is going to be at least 1280 blocks away from my platform. So between all the gear I'd be bringing for the dragon fight and all the spruce slabs I'd need to bridge there, my inventory alone wasn't going to cut it. The next morning I was greeted by our third wandering trader and this guy must have been reading my Yelp reviews because he knew exactly what I wanted. So I busted out my wallet, rescued him from the tree, and bought everything from coral blocks to sand, both of the dyes, my favorite flower, and even some buckets of tropical fish that I could put in my pond. Next was to begin collecting logs for thousands of slabs that I would need. By my estimates, 8 stacks of logs would be enough to make it even if it was much further away than the 1280 block minimum. And by the end of the day, I had 6 stacks already, plus 2 from my trading chest to get me close enough to the 8. Then I moved on to more pressing matters, like dyeing my bed blue. The last thing to do was gather up the rest of the supplies. I needed enough food and arrows to get me to the stronghold, through the dragon fight, and also an end city, because I wasn't coming home without an elytra. Once I was sure that I had everything I needed, I crafted up the slabs and threw an eye to figure out where I was going. Then I was ready. Off I went, 
bridging into the unknown in the dark of the night. When I reached the Mushroom Island, I thought about looting it, but it didn't make sense to waste inventory slots when I could easily fly out here with an elytra when I returned. So I bridged on, making a quick stop at the Snowy Rock Island to craft more slabs, and then continued, only stopping when I noticed something new. An ancient city. After some more bridging, I was able to get a closer look, and it made me curious if the area would still be mob-proof like normal ancient cities. But that was irrelevant. I still had a lot of ground to cover. Or void, I guess. Just one misclick, and I'd be cast into the abyss, never to return. It took me an entire night of bridging to catch a glimpse of my destination. But there it was. Nothing but some specks of grey along the horizon. It took another 10 minutes to arrive, and by the time I did, night had fallen. I used my water bucket as a way down, firing my bow until it was safe to descend, lighting up the area so I could safely retrieve my water and return. Using it again to make my way into the portal room, I broke the spawner and found myself face to face with the end portal. I placed the eyes in. Sixty-one days of preparation leading up to this moment. I wasted no time bridging to the island and digging out a staircase to my enemy, the Ender Dragon. The only thing standing between me and the next chapter of this story. The first end crystal was popped, then the second. And the battle had begun. I ran to the center of the island, making short work of another three crystals. never remaining in the same spot long enough to be hit by the dragon's breath. Then a fifth crystal, and a sixth, leaving just three standing, two armored, one not. The armored ones were slightly more complicated, requiring a specific angle to take out. And the last one standing was no match for my... No match for my aim. From there out, the dragon was fair game. In the moments where the dragon perched, I stayed back, not seeing a reason to engage when I had plenty of arrows and all the time in the world. Of course, that left me vulnerable to the dragon's charge attack, so I needed to remain ready to dodge. The next time the dragon perched, I was ready, bringing it down to two thirds of its health. But what I wasn't ready for was its charge attack, getting clipped on the first pass and tossed on the second. But I recovered quickly, landing a series of shots and dropping it under half of its health. Now that the dragon was actually staying within range, I was landing shot after shot. Once it was down to 20%, it had the audacity to start taunting me, just flying in circles directly above me. But by the next time the dragon perched, I had lowered it down to one shot. And so I took a step back, just waiting, knowing that the fight was over, and as soon as the perch was over, I would deal the final blow. I used the XP to mend all my tools, made sure to grab the egg, and then restocked my arrows. I built a little shack that I could use to fight Endermen. This way I had some pearls ready for the end city looting ahead of me. From there, I staircased up to the gateway, building a platform around the edge before using a trapdoor to crawl through. 
To my surprise, I turned around and witnessed an N city load in right in front of me. And it even had an N ship too. On my way over to it, I stopped for a minute to grab some chorus fruit. Chorus flowers. And some end stone too. Just to get the boring stuff out of the way. Making my way over, I noticed a second end city. This one also having a ship. But I only had one thing in mind. My elytra. The first shulker I ran into realized he'd made a mistake. And, understandably, ran away. The second one wasn't so lucky, and once I was allowed to use my legs again, I claimed my first shulker shell, and elytra. From one chest, I got an armor trim, my first diamonds, and a saddle for my non-existent horse. From the second chest, a fire prat chest plate. On the roof of the end ship, I used the stuff I brought to add the enchantments to the elytra. I stored what I could inside my ender chests, and then it was time to go shulker hunting. The way I like to handle my end looting is by completely clearing out a few end cities in one go. This way I have enough shulker shells that I don't have to come back anytime soon. Because, I don't know about you, but I happen to quite like the control of my own movement that gravity gives me. This shulker hunting part lasted about 40 minutes, as I cleared out 4 end cities before calling it quits. Three of those end cities had ships, allowing me to get a couple spare elytras. When all was said and done, I ended up with 56 shulker shells. I returned to the main island through a gateway and then jumped into the portal to return home. I arrived with a splash into my pond, only to realize that two of my fish were missing. I guess that's what happens when you don't feed them for three days. Anyway, this was the main loot I returned with. I tried out the armor trim just to see what it looked like. Out of all the types, I liked the look of the iron the most, but not more than the regular old diamond. So I put my pants back on and went on with my day. With my new elytra, I could finally begin exploring what the rest of the void had to offer. On my way to the stronghold, I flew over the ancient city and noticed that there was actually an ocean monument not too far away. But my goal right now was to loot the stronghold since I didn't get the chance to earlier. I got some ice cubes from the frozen water fountains, and from the first library, more armor trims, an enchanted book, regular books, paper, an empty map, and then I checked out a few more books and looted the second library, which didn't really have much. Disappointed with the stronghold loot, I flew over to this little blob of sand, which is actually buried treasure. From this, I got water breathing potions, gold, diamonds, and a heart of the sea. But then my looting run was interrupted by phantoms, so I decided to loot the ancient city instead where the phantoms couldn't get to me. I quickly learned that, unlike normal ancient cities, mobs could actually spawn here, which made this a lot more dangerous. The main thing I wanted from this place was a quick sneak 3 book. But with my inventory a complete mess, I had to stop to craft some shulker boxes so I could keep going. The cool thing about this type of generation is that I didn't have to worry about all the sensors and shriekers that would normally spawn in between all the buildings, because there were no blocks there so I was able to loot a lot of this place without needing wool. From my third chest, I actually got Swift Sneak 3, and put it on my pants right away. I'm always blown away by how much different it feels having this enchantment again. Despite already having what I came for, I couldn't stop myself from exploring more. That's when I realized the entire center of the city was surrounded by slime chunks. And so I took the time to farm some slime, not actually having a need for it yet, but it's always nice to have. And this got me thinking that I could actually steal the redstone components in the city's hidden rooms. But these rooms were actually teeming with mobs, so I ended up deciding that I'd try to take a different angle of approach, carving a new entrance and using the peekaboo tactics to take out their ankles from safety. This allowed me to get a foothold and begin lighting up the room. After making sure the coast was clear, I began looting all of the redstone I could. From redstone dust, to repeaters, torches, and even comparators. If you're wondering why I actually need all this redstone stuff, just know it'll go on to solve a key problem that I have later on. I stumbled across a room that had a grass floor, and I'm sorry if this bothers you, but I'm also not, because I didn't have a silk touch shovel and I needed this grass. On my way out, I found a flaw in the baby zombie's pathfinding, 
standing there in a spot where they should have easily been able to jump up and hit me, but they did nothing. Then I was out of there. I did continue to loot chests throughout the night, but to be fair, there wasn't really anything I got that was worth talking about. So I bid my farewells and flew to the ocean monument out of curiosity, noticing one of the new trail ruin structures in the distance. As far as the ocean monument goes, I decided that I didn't want to mess with that, being that the entire mob cap would be filled with guardians. On the way back though, I made a stop at the dripstone island to grab some dripstone, just in case I wanted to make a lava farm at some point. And as the sun set on day 67, I had made it back home, dumping off my new loot. But it struck me that night, I had no plans what I was going to do with the next 33 days. So I came to the conclusion that I'd work on finishing the base, more specifically, the outer ring that was still completely hollow. And the coolest thing that I could think to put there was mini versions of some of my favorite biomes, as that would allow me to make use of all the surrounding islands and bring a much needed touch of color to my base. In preparation, I used paint.net to map out my plans for the biomes. Once it was finished, I was ready to begin working on the first biome, which was the desert. But the problem was that I only had 64 sand which meant I was going to need to build a sand duper. This is where those redstone components I stole earlier would come into play. So I got a shell curve materials ready, grabbed a red mushroom and mycelium block, and traveled to the stronghold. I removed the staircase leading up to the portal, and used the red mushroom to destroy the portal frames, making room for the duper. I used a very cheap design by Razeworks for this one. And as always, there will be a link to the original tutorial. The only thing left to do now was turn it on. What I forgot was that my end platform wasn't boxed in, so all the sand ended up falling into the void. Save this bit here. And that wasn't going to be enough. So I mined some obsidian for another portal, because I was not going to keep flying 2000 blocks to the stronghold over and over. I flew to the warped forest biome, and began bridging to where I'd need to build the portal. I created a platform so I wouldn't fall off, and lit it up. Then it was time to test my math. I ran the sand duper again for a little while, but it turns out adding another row of slabs wasn't enough, so I again lost my sand. I went back home and returned with the materials to build an actual collection system because I was not about to mess this up again. Traveling back through the nether, I wanted to check out this island here, which is actually designed to be a second starter island if you want to start in the nether. From it, I got lava and blue ice. Not anything important really. I just didn't want anyone to be confused when these items popped up later on. I fired up the sand duper for the final time, this time duping gravel too, because I was going to need to use the coarse dirt trick again to get dirt for some of the biomes. Going through to collect my spoils, I found that, unsurprisingly, a single hopper was not enough to keep up with the rates. But what was important was that my blocks didn't end up in the void, which meant I could finally begin the biomes. Yeah. That was a problem. One way I could solve it was by placing string under the sand, but there was no way I'd have enough. Another way was to use sandstone slabs, but again, I didn't have enough. So the next best thing was to use birch slabs. I used my fortune hoe from the ancient city to collect as many saplings as I could, then took them home to farm up the wood. And the slabs. After some thought, I decided that the witch had served her purpose and relieved her from her duties allowing me to remove the mess of a cage to make room for the biome and start placing the sand. Once it was finished, it was still looking a little bit too empty. I mean, it was literally just a sand floor. So I went to the desert island to steal the cactus and dead bush, which would help a little. But with the rest of the space, I wanted to build a desert well. I used my sand to craft up some sandstone and got to work playing around with a few designs, and killing the mobs for some peace and quiet, until I eventually settled on one that looked like the real thing. Then I just sort of scattered a few sandstone slabs around the biome to give it some more variation. For the next biome, we had the warped forest, and to get the netherrack for it, I was going to need to hunt down ruined portals. Can we just take a second to appreciate how beautiful these complementary shaders are? My strategy for these was to build a platform underneath the portal, this way I could mine all of the netherrack without losing any to the void. From the first one, I got three and a half stacks, but I was also planning to build the crimson forest, so I was definitely going to need some more. 
Flying around through the nothingness gave me a weird feeling. The only thing that I had for a point of reference was the occasional structure. As day 73 began, I collected the netherrack from a second ruined portal, and then found a shipwreck which gave me a couple new armor trims, some more buried treasure, and then a second portal which gave me another four stacks of netherrack. After flying home and dropping off the loot, I began placing it down, and after filling it in completely, it was looking like I'd actually have enough for both biomes. The next step was to grab a warped nylium from the nether, and to save myself some time later, I got the crimson one as well. Then it was just a matter of bone mailing the entire section until every block was warped nylium. I used more bone meal to grow some plants and some warped fungi, and some twisted vines, completing the biome. Next up on the list was the cherry grove biome, but because I would need to fill the entire thing with dirt, I realized that I wasn't going to have enough gravel for the coarse dirt trick. So I took a field trip back to the stronghold to dupe some more. Five minutes later, I had a shulker worth. Back home, I began converting it into dirt, but my shovel was too slow to instamine it, so I had to upgrade it with efficiency and mending before the real party could start. And I guess party isn't really the right word for it, because it took 20 minutes to convert all the gravel to dirt. An entire day of placing blocks and breaking them. Over and over. But in the end, it was definitely worth it, because I now had half a shulker of dirt. Which would not only be enough to fill in the floor of the cherry grove biome, but also the other two biomes that needed dirt too. I placed some grass blocks around the biome so it could spread. And if letting dirt blocks plummet into the void isn't a sign of how much progress I've made, I don't know how to end this statement. As fun as watching grow grass- wow. I took a trip to the Cherry Grove Island. Checking my elytra durability as always, it being full as always, to grab some pink petals and a sapling. So I could start farming more saplings. So I chopped one down, and I think these might be the best trees as far as sapling profits go because I was able to plant an entire forest from just one chopped down tree. What wasn't so easy, however, was getting them to grow in a direction that I actually wanted. So it took a few tries chopping them down and regrowing them to get a look that I liked. I added pink petals while waiting for the leaves from the failed attempts to decay, and then tried getting a bee nest to spawn so I could add it to the cherry grove. But after 15 minutes straight of growing trees, I gave up. It just wasn't meant to be. So the cherry grove was officially complete, and it was time to move on to the crimson forest, after a quick tool repair that is. This process was essentially identical to the warped forests, just instead of all the blue stuff, it was red this time. I added all the crimson plants using bone meal, as well as the fungi, and after finishing the biome, I saw something new. Not just one, but three sheep and a chicken. So after having that square for dozens of days and not getting a single passive mob to spawn, I got four from the cherry grove biome in mere minutes. For our next biome, we have the end biome. Endstone seemed like a safe bet, but my two stacks weren't going to get it done. So I vandalized my end island for more, mining out a room until I had seven stacks. I then used those seven stacks to outline an area that was twice the size I intended and proceeded to fill it in, because I was facetiming my girlfriend and not paying attention. When I inevitably ran out of endstone, I realized my mistake. I'm dumb. Luckily, the side that was more filled in was the one that I was supposed to do, so the cleanup wasn't too bad. For the rest of the end, I planted a bunch of chorus flowers, and then used the end rods to light the place up. Then I added these little pedestals for the dragon head, and egg. I'd also need to remove the massive bridge leading to where the Taiga Island once was. You know, it, in hindsight, it probably would have made a little bit more sense to go the opposite direction. That was pretty much it for the end biome. The chorus plants would need trimmed later, but for now, I could move on to the next biome. This next one was going to be the deep dark biome, and unfortunately, I didn't have much in the form of skulk. So, it was time to return to the ancient city. After using my shears to steal a bunch of wool, I was able to explore the areas that I couldn't last time I was here. So the goal was to collect everything I would need to make a mini deep dark biome with a few ancient city-like structures. 
from Deep Slate to Skulk Veins, Shriekers and Skulk Blocks, Catalysts, Candles and Skulls, I collected it all. Returning to my base on day 82, I started placing down the floor, first using Deep Slate to create patches that I would later surround with Skulk. When that was done, I used soul torches to light it all up, and then tried my best to make a few structures that resembled the ones you find in ancient cities. Then all that was left was the finishing touches, like the shriekers, skulk veins, the skelly skull, and candles. After lighting them up, this biome was complete, but then I noticed that the end had become a complete mess. So here I am, Landscaper Ost at your service. With the end looking a lot more clean, I tried burning my bridges, but Minecraft Fire doesn't really work like that. So I tried a better method. Procrastination. The next biome was the snow biome. I used a snow golem to create an infinite snowball farm. Then I turned them into snow blocks so I could create the floor. At this moment, I realized I could have been using snow blocks for temporary blocks this entire time. That would have made it way easier to remove the bridges I no longer needed but there was no going back now. On the left side of the biome, I built an igloo, using an image off the wiki to make sure the dimensions were correct, and moved the snow golem in, thinking that the igloo would make for a much better home than the shade of a random tree. Next I needed to get a shovel with silk touch on it so that I could farm snow layers instead of snow balls. Then I could turn the taiga trees into snowy taiga trees, finishing the snow biome. Last up is the Mushroom Island. For that, I had to steal some mycelium to go with all the dirt, and then remove the rest of the cobblestone under the mob farm to make room for what was probably the most simple biome yet. Because there was nothing I could do to speed up the mycelium's growth, I shifted my focus to figuring out how to fix the ugly stairs I built when I was poor. And while I was collecting cobblestone to fix them, I began wondering why I was also using the same cobble generator as I was when I was poor. The next morning, I used the cobblestone to start renovating the first staircase. I wanted to turn the bridges between the platforms into a tunnel through the staircase, and then began filling in the sides to make it seem more solid. It was at this point where I needed to make a decision of whether I was going to let the villagers roam free, or figure out a replacement for the fence. And so I let them be free. After a little more placing, the staircase was complete. I was happy with the way it turned out, but it got me thinking that filling in the walls where the outer ring was could make it look even better. But there was no way I was going to gather enough cobblestone for that with this old generator. Before I forgot though, I wanted to add the mushrooms to the mushroom biome, first cutting two down to collect some, and then giving the biome a nice mix of each type. And that was all of them. Not a bad transformation from the hunk of dirt I started on. But there was still work to be done, starting with a new and improved cobble generator. I decided to build it in the end since the base was mostly made out of wood, and I didn't really like the idea of burning it down. I kinda built this thing from memory, so I wasn't sure if it was actually going to work. But it did. Very much so. Going from mining two blocks a time to four, and having hoppers to keep the drops from burning was a whole new game. The only problem was that it wasn't cobblestone. So I needed to go back to the overworld for a new pick. I had a decent pickaxe from the end city loot, and traded for mending, and efficiency so I could upgrade it. Then I was ready to go again, this time actually farming the block that I needed. So I remained here for the next 10 minutes, mining away. Ending up with more cobblestone than I could carry. Then it was time to take what I did with the first staircase and apply it to the other three. So day 88 was declared National Staircase Day. I didn't finish them until most of the way through the night. But I was kind of tired of these giant trees blocking all my showcases, so the rest of the night was spent reliving my lumberjack days. Day 89 the trees were no more, and I wanted to test out the idea of filling in the walls, just to see if I would actually like the look of it. And I know it's a lot of cobblestone, but I think it actually makes the build look more solid, if that makes any sense. It makes me feel like I'm actually inside the build rather than just hanging out on the edge of a platform. Now, unfortunately, I didn't include the cost of the walls in my last cobblestone budget. So... Hopefully that'll do it. And I again found myself placing cobble for most of the night. I'd say that's a huge improvement from what we had here before. The new ugliest part of this base is actually the center now, with all the chests and plants everywhere. 
So what I did next was start converting the old tree growing section into my new living area. I first moved the crafting station over there. And then made some chests so I could finally organize the chest monster I'd been building for 89 days. I put blocks like dirt and sand in the first chest. The second one became my wood chest. Another for all the different types of stone, deep slate and deep dark blocks, nether blocks, one for redstone stuff, and related blocks, all of my riches, plants, which I probably should have broken down into smaller categories, but I made it fit, mob drops, this one's like decorative blocks I guess, a chest for all my armor, another for tools, weapons, and other equipment, and the last one was for my treasure items. Also, I finally used that empty map I got, so here's what my base looked like. Pretty cool. Other than the fact that it's not centered. That's not cool at all. The white dot also served as a reminder that I forgot to move the cleric with the rest of his friends, so I had to fix that. And I figured now was as good a time as any to finally remove this 2000 block bridge. I didn't actually remove the entire thing, just enough so that it wouldn't be visible from the outermost island. That night, I moved my bed and my cat into the new area. Day 92, I experimented with an idea I had for upgrading the middle of the base. First, I had to get rid of the garden I no longer needed, and fill in the space with slabs. Then the old cobble generator needed to go. So what actually was my plan for the spot? Well, I thought it would be cool to build a perfect replica of my original Skyblock Island in the center of the pond. To do that, I needed to remove all the dirt and lower the water level by a block. Then of course, I needed to farm more cobblestone to expand the pond so that the island could actually fit in it. Once the outer walls were pushed out, I began removing the inside to let the water free, and then added more water so the edges would be filled in. The villagers seemed to think that I was building them a swimming pool, so I didn't really have a choice but to make the outer edge a little lower. It didn't exactly look better than the previous design, but if it meant not having villagers trapped in there 24-7, I could deal with it. For some reason, while all the other villagers were working, this guy felt the need to stalk me. So I'm now convinced that he's a psychopath. Next, I began working on the island itself, wanting it to be a perfect replica to the point of actually checking my old recordings to see what direction it was facing. The layer on top was just used as a template, so I could fill in the bottom easier. And then I removed it after, leaving us with three layers of dirt, just like the original. The last thing I did was replace the top layer of dirt with the grass blocks I got from the ancient city, because I didn't feel like waiting for it to grow. Using this screenshot as a reference, I planted the tree in the correct place, and kept growing them until I got one that was the right height. Once I did, I removed the corner leaves to make it more accurate, and then tried to make the grass as perfect as possible, adding the poppy and dandelion too. Then for the chest, I wanted to fill it with the exact items that were in it when we started, so I went to the end to farm 10 obsidian, and placed every item in the exact spot it was in when we started. So there it was, an exact replica of the original island, serving as a constant reminder of how far this place had come. But there were still six days left, which meant I had enough time to fight the weather. So I crafted up a blast protection chest plate, bought some food and arrows, grabbed the smite sword I got from an end city, made a few more trades, and entered the nether. Now, just like the overworld, the nether is also an infinite dimension with a bunch of structures, meaning I could find a real fortress to farm the wither skulls in. And turns out, it's a lot easier to find them when the rest of the world doesn't exist. I realized pretty quickly that it was not going to be fun dealing with a bunch of blazes in an open area like this, but as long as I had my fire prot chest equipped, they were really more of an annoyance than an actual threat. So I began the hunt for three skulls. Since this part took half an hour, and I wanted to show it off still, all I could do was one of these. Ooh, 
with the three skulls, I got out of there. In preparation for the wither fight, I smelted some glass for bottles, brewed some swiftness potions and some strength potions, crafted some golden apples, and then I was ready. I normally fight the wither on the nether roof, but our nether doesn't even have one, so the next best thing would be the end. This way there's actual solid ground beneath my feet. The only thing I was worried about was the wither chasing endermen, or getting attacked by them myself. But this was still my best option. The fight was instantly off to a bad start. I was late with my potions and I didn't even have my chest plate on, forcing me to eat a golden apple. It didn't take much to turn the fight around though. And once you get the wither down to melee mode, and you have a smite sword, it's already over. I collected my wither star and went home, traded with a librarian for glass, and crafted up the beacon. Of course, the best block to build it out of was going to be iron. Obviously, I did want it in the center of the base, so I had no choice but to damage the replica a bit, but I'll take a missing grass block over an off-centered beacon any day. Once it was powered, I selected speed and regen as my buffs, and placed a block of glass so I wouldn't fall in. And there we go. All of my major goals were complete, but I still had another three days left. So I decided to repurpose the grass from the failed animal farm and build a sugarcane farm there instead. I still had a lot left from the farm that I had before, but there would eventually come a point where I'd run out if I continued playing on this world. Then I flew down to the cobblestone pillar that my generator had created by accident. I wanted to take the rest of the dirt and grass I had to make a proper animal farm down near void level. So I bridged out from under the shadow of the base and started building. The reason it's so low in the world is because they're supposed to spawn more frequently down here. At least, that's what the research told me. After finishing the platform and making sure it was lit up, I pillared up with some snow to make an AFK platform, realizing that I'd built it in a slime chunk. I decided to swap out the spruce slabs for glass so I could see what was going on. And I'm gonna be honest, I don't know why this wasn't working. I AFK'd here for a day and a half and didn't get a single animal. I don't know if the slimes were somehow affecting the passive mob spawns, or maybe the cats and sheep at my base were slowing the rates, but whatever it was, all this time just ended up going to waste. So not wanting the 100 days to end like this, I set a new goal to get a totem. But it was already day 100, so I had to be quick. I began power leveling a cartographer so I could buy a woodland mansion map. I grabbed my spare elytras, not knowing how far away the mansion would be, and at midday, I noticed how small my dot was. So, yeah, it wasn't looking good. But that wasn't going to stop me from trying. Not 20 seconds later, I had already matched the Y coordinate, and began making my way towards the X. After a few more rockets, my dot was getting much bigger, and just a few seconds later, I could see it. I landed on the roof and instantly noticed the evoker through the window on my left. So I put my chest plate on and went for it. I killed two evokers before making my way back onto the roof. I was surrounded by vexes and had evokers targeting me through the walls. And already having what I came for, I bailed. The totems were mine. I made it home right at sunset, cleaned up my inventory, and did one last lap around the base to take in all the cool stuff I'd built. And then, that was it. I ended it in the same exact place everything began 100 days ago. 
right on top of this old lump of dirt. Final, well-deserved rest. Get out of my bed, get out. 